Good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here today and to tell you about some of the, um, well, in fact, one of the uh, recent advances in uh, quantum algorithms for quantum chemistry. And um, so let me get started with that. So the title is a, bit, a little bit technical, but I will try to keep the, uh, the talk. Um, I'll try, first of all, I'll give you an overview. For those of you that are not uh, familiar with what uh, so-called quantum chemists do, uh, which is basically a term that refers um, exclusively to the calculation of electronic states of molecules. So basically, what one's, the, the idea is that one has molecules which consist of nuclei and um, electrons, and the nuclei are point charges here. Uh, so I'm sure this is working. Okay. Oh, there we are. Uh, the nuclei are the point charges with um, their own coordinates, capital R. The electrons have, are much, much lighter. Uh, they have coordinates little r, and the electrons move much faster. And so that enables one to use an approximation uh, whereby one wants to compute the electronic states with, for given positions of the nuclei, capital R. And so one does this by constructing uh, wave functions, which we refer to as molecular orbitals, which are built out of atomic orbitals of each of the individual atoms involved in the molecule. And then one solves for the Schrodinger equation, which is the red equation down on the bottom, in a basis of n orbitals. And this is a very nice approach because it basically reduces this um, complex uh, differential equation, set of differential equations, to linear algebra uh, via use of this fixed basis. So what do quantum chemists really want to compute? And that's summarized here. And in fact, what quantum chemists mostly want to compute, about 95% of what they want to compute, is summarized on the left-hand side, which is basically um, what's called a potential energy surface, which is basically the uh, solutions to solving the electronic Schrodinger equation as a function of the nuclear coordinates, capital R, shown here for a simple uh, two-dimensional set of coordinates so that we can actually visualize it in three dimension as uh, basically like a landscape of hills and valleys and saddle points and so on. So these electronic potential energy surfaces they're called because they form potential energy for the nuclear degrees of freedom. These are responsible for um, the many variety of molecular energies and also reaction rates between different uh, species and different states of uh, molecules. And because these, um, these reaction rates, maybe you maybe have heard of the name of Arrhenius, these reaction rates depend exponentially on the energies of these uh, saddle points between different stable minima. And for that reason, it's very important to have electronic energies calculated all over these potential surfaces very, very accurately. And of course, it's important for many applications, such as catalysis, uh, relative stabilities of states for, um, for drug design, and so on. And also, I mean, going beyond this, quantum chemists also are interested in cases where one's looking at excited electronic energies, an example shown here from Rhodopsin in Vision. Um, and for all of these cases, one needs an accurate description of the correlation between the individual electrons. So what do we mean by correlation? Well, correlation uh, technically is described as all of the effects which are not captured by a mean field uh, description of the electronic solutions. And so if you look here, um, or this, this is our notation in the, in the field for a quantum state, this uh, so-called uh, ket notation, like half of a bracket, uh, so the mean field is referred to as a Hartree-Fox solution, and here each electron is moving in an average uh, electronic field produced by all the other electrons. That's highly averaged. Everything beyond that is called correlation, and there are two types of correlation. One is the weak correlation, which comes essentially from electrons which are very close by a given electron, so you'd have this also in atoms. And more interesting to us is the strong or static correlation which is correlation deriving from configurations of the electrons, where in particular you may have electrons which are far apart on different atoms in a large molecule which are correlated together. 
And dealing with these uh, correlation energies, which may only account for 5% or even 1% of the energy or less, but these are the important final parts of the energy which are important to capture accurately to get uh, uh, reaction rates correctly and stabilities and so on. So for all these applications, one needs these carefully. One needs these to calculate very carefully. And here's my last example, motivating example, which is very much a holy grail. It's very, very far in the future. Uh, this is from biology. This is the oxygen-evolving complex of photosystem two, which is responsible for splitting of water. So this has a number of metal atoms in here. You can see manganese and calcium. And these have, these have low-lying electronic states with very different kinds of electron spin, and they have highly non-trivial correlations. And these determine the reactivity. And one needs to accurately res resolve the ordering of the low-lying states of these complexes in order to understand and use, these energy, use the um, reactivity. So again, we, need, we come back to this need for uh, generating co correlated states. So the quantum chemistry approach to this is, firstly, if we have something in an exact ba uh, finite basis, it's exponentially scaling with size. So that's classically hard. Uh, cannot be done uh, for ar arbitrarily large systems. So one solves approximate models of the Schrodinger equation as precisely as possible. And one does this to target energy gaps between, so going over this energy landscape, it's really the difference between energies that you're interested in. And wherever possible, the methods exploit cancellation of errors. And in particular, if we're interested in correlation, methods where we actually explicitly write down the wave function are really the best uh, choice today. And so as I mentioned before, the reference point is the mean field energy. Um, a method that's very commonly used is called coupled cluster, and this is a polynomial scaling method. Uh, it's order 10 in time, so that doesn't sound very bad if you're a computer scientist. Um, and it's order eight in storage, which may not sound too bad, but this is actually the really, really bad part today, which really limits uh, quantum chemistry. It's the storage of all of the, basically all of the integrals uh, that are involved. There are linear scaling approaches uh, being developed, but they are not, certainly today, not suitable for strong correlation. So if we want to look at, um, so now we look at, so what can quantum uh, computing do for this? So a former student of mine, Brian O'Gorman, a couple of years ago with um, two other uh, colleagues, uh, produced a very interesting result, which is a little bit depressing, which is that the electronic ground state evaluation is QMA complete, which is the uh, quantum analog of NP complete in classical complexity, which is basically means it's extremely hard. But this is the worst case complexity. So that doesn't mean to say that there aren't problems where one can actually get much better, um, much better scaling. And one example is actually also very well known, well known for a long time, which is a phase, quantum phase estimation, which is bounded po quantum polynomial time. And here, this is uh, very nice. You might ask, why are we not all doing this? The reason we're not all doing this today is that the cost of this scales, although it's polynomial in the size of the system, n, and also in this uh, one over the, uh, the accuracy you want to get, it's inversely uh, proportional to the overlap between a trial state that you have to posit at the beginning of the algorithm and the true state. And you need to have a good trial state. And it's very hard to get these good trial states when you have strong correlation. So what I'm uh, telling you about uh, in the remainder of the talk is this non-orthogonal quantum eigensolver that uh, shows um, polynomial cost the systems with both strong and weak electron correlations. It has an exponential gain over the corresponding classical solver called NOCI, which actually only deals with strong correlations and doesn't deal with the weak electron correlations because of the exponential cost of those. And so this is very good as a, uh, we, we believe this is good as a, uh, an ansatz for BQP so that the whole um, procedure together would then be polynomial in, in time. So, so the classical methods, so just here on the right, I've shown the, the NOCI, which is the idea where one has, uh, prepares a set of these mean field states called Hartree-Fock, and they're represented here by saying where the electrons are, the electrons are going in pairwise into different energy levels, and then each of these um, 
each of these staircases here of uh, states with electrons in them is representing one mean field state. And then one solves a linear algebra equation, this so-called CI problem, uh, with this set of reference states. And there's another approach there that I'll say something about at the end, but this is a more compact and flexible approach, so that's the one that we're looking at. And so here what you do is that you, with a given uh, basis for the molecule, you compute these mean field solutions, and then you have to construct the Hamiltonian uh, matrix between these different reference states, and you have to also calculate the overlaps and solve then this, this um, linear algebra problem here. And so this, but then we, if we want to add, this accounts for the strong correlation. If we add weak correlation, we can do this by this couple cluster approach that I mentioned before, which puts a, an exponentially, an exponentiated operator in front of the mean field solution. And these, uh, exp the, whatever we put into this exponentiated little operator here, tau, does, um, captures dynamic correlation, and it has, in principle, exponentially many contributions. And so the idea is that one would then produce these functions and do the uh, linear algebra on this, and that one would then get a good solution. And one example of this, which is very well known in quantum chemistry, is just taking double excitations, just correlations between pairs of electrons. So that all sounds very nice, but if you start to do, if you do this in a classical situation, you find that because of the non-orthogonality of these reference states, they are not actually orthogonal uh, once you have different reference states, then the matrix calculation of matrix elements will scale exponentially, and therefore this is computationally intractable to implement classically. But, so now let's consider the quantum approach. So there's two benefits of quantum for this problem. One is that we have a very efficient construction of these dynamically uh, correlated unzap states. In particular, we start first by making our couple cluster operator unitary, and that's very well known now in the field. I think it's a standard to use as trial functions in variational algorithms to use unitary couple cluster states. And then secondly, when we consider putting these weak dynamic correlations on them, we note that exponentials of many-body operators are very straightforward and efficient to evaluate on a quantum computer using Hamiltonian simulation methods. And basically, summarize, the idea is that summarized down here. You take your excitation operator, which consists of, say, four electron terms here, and you basically decompose it as Pauli strings, and then the exponential of these Pauli strings can be decomposed into products of unitaries by, by several different ways today and it can be done efficiently. So here's our algorithm uh, for computing electronic states, uh, what we call the no with the non-orthogonal quantum eigensolver. So it basically consists of two classical preprocessing states, um, steps. One is to solve for the reference states, the non-orthogonal reference states. Secondly, to compute uh, the, to, as to go to classical quantum chemistry to get insight, to compute a particular set of these cluster amplitudes and put those in. Then we make a quantum calculation of these matrix elements that I'll show you on the next slide. And having computed those matrix elements, we go back to our classical computer and solve the generalized eigenvalue problem in the NOQE basis. So we are basically using the quantum solver to do the part that's classically intractable and exponentially scaling. So this is a circuit which uh, will evaluate those off-diagonal, those, those matrix elements, uh, the off-diagonal ones in particular, both for the Hamiltonian and for the, um, and for the um, overlap matrix elements. Uh, so I won't go into that, the reference is there. If people are interested, can go and look at how that's done. But this is, is done, the point is that this is done very efficiently. So it's basically in polynomial time, these circuits can be polynomial scaling of the number of the size of the system, these circuits can be run. So here's an example. Uh, so there's an example where uh, we took an inspiration from, and again, this method relies on taking inspiration from classical chemistry methods. So we took what uh, seems relatively innocuous, relatively straightforward, is the MP2 second order um, perturbation theory approach, 
We use those MP2 amplitudes as input to the second order couple cluster representation and then made a low rank decomposition of the uh, cluster operator. And in this paper that I put so here, we have applications to the H2 molecule and H4. Now this may seem, before I show you the results, this may seem like very, very small systems, and indeed they are, but H4 is a standard benchmark in the quantum chemistry field for systems of strong correlation. Those, um, and so here's an example that maybe motivates this. Um, re very recent calculation of electronic states of a rather complex um, system here with four, we, we call these four radicals, meaning four metal sites that have unpaired electrons. There's an iron, a nickel, a nickel, and an iron here. And that's exactly the system like in the oxygen evolving complex where you have to get very accurate or, um, understanding of the energy levels, of this, the, the relative ordering of the energy levels of the spins, the electron spins. And this seems like a very, very complex system. And it's so complex that classical methods really only uh, have been used using density functional theory, which is a much more appro approximate method than any wave function based method. Um, but these authors took a H4 system, in this case a linear system, and did um, a strongly correlated uh, calculation with that. And they actually found that they could re reproduce, so these are the experimental spin levels here, and they could reproduce perfectly the ordering. Maybe they wouldn't get exactly the relative energies correct, but they got the orderings absolutely correct from this strongly correlated hydrogen chain model. So this is a motivation for, uh, even though these ca current calculations I'm going to show you are very um, small systems, for the, it's a motivation for the power of this method uh, considering these radical states. So here's uh, just some of the uh, results, just to show you uh, two different features here. The first feature is for the very smallest system, the H2. So these are, these are completely non-variational non calculations. We just input the classical information from the MP2 and the uh, classical um, um, initial uh, Hartree-Fox states, and then we run the quantum eigensolver. So here you see, this is actually the, the energy gap between the lowest energy, which is a singlet state, and then the, which where the electrons are paired, and the next energy, which is a triplet state, where the two electrons are parallel. This is a two electron problem. So it has two radical sites in that language. And you see, and the, these uh, different lines show three different scalings of the MP2 amplitudes, which are also taken from the classical calculations. So every, all the input here is classical. Um, and you see that for the better uh, scaling, so you, the red and the blue lines, for the entire range of internuclear distances beyond what's called the Coulson-Fisher point here, which is the point at which you have in this description both a triplet and a singlet, you're always within this level of chemical accuracy. And for quantum chemists, chemical accuracy is sort of the gold standard where you want to be uh, in terms of accuracy. So you, you're not, you don't care about getting the totally exact solution, but you want to be within this regime of about one milli Hartree. So that's accuracy. And then secondly, on the right-hand side, we have the H4. Uh, one example for the H4 is just the lowest energy um, state, which is a singlet state. And here you see, uh, compared with the full CI, which is the exact solution in this basis set, uh, that's a black line down here, and the quantum eigensolver, the green line, is very close over the entire range of um, positions, uh, unlike the classical eigensolver, which only has strong correlation and doesn't have the weak dynamic correlation in there. So we have basically high uh, accuracy and also um, ability to deal with these strong correlations. So here's now uh, thinking about how does this scale. So here are some resource estimates. Uh, so in terms of gate count complexities, the overall gate count um, complexity for evaluating matrix elements down here scales uh, basically quadratic in the size of the system, n, the number of spin orbitals. It's also quadratic in the number of radical sites. Uh, sorry, yeah, it's, sorry, it's also quadratic in m, which is the number of orthogonal reference states. And those reference states depend um, as a factorially on the number of radical sites d. But 
This is where uh, it's very important to note the domain-specific uh, input here. For chemistry, you'd never be considering molecular-based systems or complexes with more than 10 radical sites. Even the oxygen-involving complex doesn't have more than 10 radical sites. So that's not so bad. And if you compare the scaling then uh, with classical coupled cluster, this, if you evaluate the numbers, this is a lot, lot worse. And the, the classical reference that I showed you before it also is, is worse in terms of scaling. So now if I, yeah, so this is my last two slides now. So let me just summarize then, first of all, the benefits. So we have this capturing strong and weak correlation. To my knowledge, this is the only system, only method in quantum chemistry that does capture both strong and weak correlation almost on, on the same footing. Uh, classically difficult problems with strong and weak correlation would be of the order of a, uh, something with eight unpaired spins, which only amounts to 70 by 70 uh, in terms of the multi-reference Hamiltonian, so easily doable, depending upon the size of the basis. So. And it's not a hybrid method. We have uh, classical impossible uh, exponential scaling, so we have a practical quantum advantage here. And then let me just close with this slide here. Where are we going with this? So we're actually now currently implementing it for smaller systems on near-term machines. We're looking at the measurement overhead, uh, which is required to resolve matrix elements. We're improving the gate complexity count further with different uh, cluster operators. And we're investigating really the use of this as a long-term. This, this can be implemented on near-term machines, but it's also a long-term algorithm where it has great utility, the state preparation routine for doing then very efficient quantum phase estimation because of the accuracy of the ansatz that you get at the end. So on the right-hand side here, the bottom last thing, is the infidelity of the H4 calculations for, for the ground state. And you see that we have infidelities of the order of 10 to the minus 3. So meaning you have 99.9% uh, fidelity with the true ground state at that point. So that's a really good situation to start with for doing quantum phase estimation. So with that, let me close and thank all my co-workers, uh, which is basically, this is a collaboration between my, my own group here on the right and the group of Mar my colleague, Martin Head Gordon, who is a classical quantum chemist uh, on the left and with Bill Huggins at Google. Thank you very much.